So this talk uh, is going to explore two libraries, ZAR and HDF5. Both of these libraries solve a very similar problem. So the goal of this talk is to help you kind of understand the places where they differ so that you can make an informed uh, decision on which one of these libraries to use for yourself. So uh, hopefully everyone here has heard of at least one of these libraries. If you've heard of at least one, you will understand a lot about the other one because they're extremely similar. Um, but just kind of as a refresher, or if you haven't heard of either of these, I'm gonna cover some of the core shared concepts between these before diving into the differences. So the most important thing is that ZAR and HDF5 are designed to handle multi-dimensional data. So if you're used to modeling your data with NumPy arrays, uh, that's kind of the model you wanna think of, not so much Pandas data frames. Um, you can store you know, a 1D array or a 2D array, but it's really designed to scale up to like three or four D. So in this example, imagine you've got some weather sensors and you're collecting temperature and precipitation readings from around the world. To identify any scalar data point in this data set, uh, you would need to know what the reference time is, the longitude and the latitude, and then the field that you're collecting. So in this case, you would have a four dimensional data set. You'll notice that I've not drawn a four dimensional data set on the slide because I do not know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> the other kind of important concept that both HDF5 and ZAR uh, are trying to cover is that they're designed to store a lot of data, which means that you're going to want to use compression. Uh, in short terms, uh, as a, in a compressed form, compression is the same information taking up less space. Uh, there's generally two kinds of compression, lossless, where you can recover exactly the same information, and lossy. Uh, both HDF5 and ZAR support both of these kinds of compression. And then finally, in order to get compression, you're basically going to try to look for patterns in the data and like common them up or various other things. I don't know a ton about compression. But what you lose when you compress data is the ability to do random access. So if you have a big multidimensional data set, it's very nice that you can get any scalar value in constant time by just applying an indexer along every axis. Um, once you've compressed the data, you can no longer do that because you don't know where the values live after you've done all your compression. So this means that if you wanted to access a scalar data point, if you stored all your data in one big blob that was compressed, you'd have to decompress the whole thing and index into it. What chunks do is they say, instead of storing the data in one big blob, what if we broke it up into little blobs uh, based on the semantic space? So in this case, we've got a nine by nine data set. We've chosen to break it up into little three by three data sets. We can then compress each of these blocks separately and store them uh, after compression separately. So now if we knew that we wanted to access the data uh, point at zero, zero, we would only need to load this little three by three piece and decompress it. Uh, the way you choose the shapes of the chunks and the size of the chunks really depends on how you're going to access the data. So in this 2D case, imagine we always wanted to read an entire column at once. In that case, then we should probably choose a chunk that holds the entire column in one allocation that gets compressed together and then decompressed together. If we always need a row, we would do the same thing with just a row. This type of chunking would be good if maybe we, we need a data point in all of its neighbors, but not much more than that. Uh, I'm not going to cover exactly how you should pick that. There's a lot of good posts on that and information about that, but both SAR and HDF5 support the same kinds of chunking, so that's not really a difference between these two libraries. Uh, just in short, compression is a, a trade-off between the ability to do random access in your data set and the compression you get. So if you want to store a smaller file, you're going to have slower random access. Uh, another way to think of that is a throughput versus latency. So if your goal is just to read the entire data set into memory, you shouldn't use chunking. You should just compress the whole thing in one big block, read the smallest amount of data into memory, and then use it. But if you want to be able to access small data points very quickly, then you probably should choose smaller chunks. Uh, this lets us reduce I.O., and we can cache the, the different blocks without holding the entire data set in memory at once. HDF5 and ZAR also support storing more than one data set in a single file. So instead of storing just one multidimensional uh, data set, you can store a tree that resembles a POSIX file system. So you'll notice that the file starts with a slash, kind of like the, on a Linux or, or Mac file system. Inside that, you can store data sets and groups. Groups can then store more data sets and groups, and this nests probably to some reasonable computer limit, but conceptually infinitely. Uh, so in some terms, a data set is the name for one of these multidimensional arrays that lives as the leaves in your tree. A group is a collection of data sets or more groups. That kind of recurses. And a node is either a data set or a group. 
every gr uh, node in the tree can also have associated arbitrary key value data. Um, this is a property of a node, so both data sets and groups can have this. And uh, Czar stores this in a JSON format, HDF5 stores it in a binary format, but it's basically arbitrary key value data. Uh, if you want to interface with Czar or HDF5 from Python, uh, we're going to use there's two libraries for, for interfacing with the HDF5. There's PyTables and H5Py. This talk is going to all cover H5Py because it has a near identical interface to Czar, as we will see. So the general concepts in the Python interfaces of these two libraries is that you have a collection of nested dictionaries to represent your tree. The keys of the dictionary are strings, um, which are the components of the group names or the dataset names. And the leaves of this tree are array-like objects. Uh, what I mean by array-like is that they are well, not themselves NumPy arrays, but you can pass anything that you could pass into the brackets of a NumPy array, you can pass into the brackets of these leaves. So you can like pass a Boolean mask or an integer indexers, uh, scalar numbers along all the dimensions, and so on. These objects also have a .d type attribute that tells you what the NumPy D type of this thing is, and they have a .dot shape attribute that tells you the shape. So you can kind of think of them like NumPy arrays. Um, and yeah, again, this describes H5Py. This is not how Py tables represents the data. Uh, to show kind of opening a file in Czar, you import Czar, call Czar.open, pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll notice that this returns a group object, so the file itself is also a group, and it's the root group because there's no uh, parents of this. If we want to put a data set into this file, we can assign into it like a dictionary with a NumPy array. In this case, it's a 20 by 5 array of integers. And if we repr it, we'll notice that we don't read back out the original array. We get back this array-like object, which in this case is czar.core array. We can see the path to this thing. We can see the shape 20 by 5, and we can see it holds in 64s. Uh, we can also pass it stuff into the in square brackets, which we could do with NumPy. Uh, importantly, though, every time you access it, it's going to do I.O., probably with some caching behind the scenes, but maybe not. Um, so if you just want to load the data into a NumPy array to do lots of processing, you can index with a colon to copy it. So the last thing actually gives us a NumPy array with the same contents. Uh, this is the same code, but with H5Py. So I'm just going to kind of show it a few times. <laughs> We've changed two lines of code. The first line is uh, import H5Py, and the second line is h5py.file instead of czar.open. The repers are different, but the same information is there, slightly different encoding. So they pretty much have a drop in, near drop-in replacement with, an API, uh, with the Python API. Uh, some extra functionality not shown here. Every node has an adders property that is a dictionary-like object to get access to that key value store. Group objects have a method called create dataset. And this is how you should actually create data sets. Please never do that array assignment thing I just showed. That will store the entire array in one chunk with no compression, um, which maybe for my like little 20 by 5 thing, that would be fine. But in a, if you're using Czar or HDF5, that's probably not fine. Um, so this method lets you pass the chunk shape and compression and a few other parameters. The signature is almost identical between Czar and HDF5 is, or H5Py as well. Uh, there's also create group to create subgroups. And data sets have a method called redirect. Uh, this is what it's called in H5Py. It's got a much more verbose name in Czar that I can't remember. Uh, it's like get basic selection or something. And what this lets you do is read memory into an existing buffer without allocating. So this is an important API to look at if you are doing some high performance reads. So the libraries model the same things. They have basically the same Python interface. How would you choose to use one versus the other? Um, so we're going to start covering some of the differences between these. So first, HDF5 is over 20 years old. HDF5 is almost as old as I am. Uh, it, it has excellent cross-language support. So HDF5 can be used within Fortran, C, C Sharp, C++, like Java, Go. Any language that you would deploy to production, you can use HDF5 with. Um, of course, Python as well. Uh, because it's really old and it has really good cross-language support, there's a lot of existing software that exists. So kind of two things that I would say immediately disqualifies R are if you know that you're going to need to use the data set from within a C++ program already, or uh, you are currently consuming a program that uses HDF5 that's not written in Python, then you probably should not look at R. HDF5 is going to be really good for that, that use case, um, and R doesn't currently have anything to, to handle that well. Uh, HDF5 itself is written in C, and in my opinion, it's one of the cleanest, like most easy to read code bases. It's all object-oriented code in C and has structured exception handling. It's like a weird dialect, but very well documented. Um, 
like well commented, um, pretty easy to follow what's going on. Uh, HDF5 can be made thread safe. So by default, it is not thread safe, meaning you cannot do concurrent access to the same file from the same process. You can compile HDF5 to be thread safe, but as the docs say, thread safe does not mean thread optimal. All thread safety does is it adds locks to the code so that it serializes access to the file. It does not actually make it like work in parallel. I think you can do it through an MPI driver, but it's um, much harder to use and means you have to be using MPI. Uh, and then HDF5, because it's in C, can be extended in C. So we can extend the functionality uh, with plugins. Czar, on the other hand, was first released in 2015, uh, and the 1.0 release was sometime in 2016, so it's much, much newer. It's written in Python. It's pure Python, uses NumPy, but other than that, I think there's no native code in Czar. And I would say that at least for now, it's very much Python oriented. It's like designed to be consumed from Python um, with, and like Python ecosystem in mind. However, it does have a reasonable specification that could be re-implemented and has been re-implemented in C++. I don't know how stable that, that implementation is, but it, it, it is possible. And the Azar team is working on making that more of a spec than, than a Python code artifact. So this will probably improve in the future. Uh, Zar does have multi-threading support, which in my opinion is really important um, based on kind of the, the way you configure Zar, you can make it actually access files concurrently. Uh, and because R is written in Python and is Python oriented, you can extend it in Python. Uh, so when I say that you can extend both HDF5 and Zar, what I mean, there's really two classes of extensions that you can write, filters and compressors and storage backends. And we're gonna go into those in detail um, in just a second. So when you're trying to make your choice, you really should look at which extensions do the libraries actually come with. So which of these filters and compressors and storage backends are you just gonna get out of the box how easy is it for you to write your own uh, filter or compressor or storage backend for a non-default use case? And how easy is it to distribute these, these extensions? And distribute can either mean distributing your plugin to other people or consuming a plugin that maybe someone else has written already. Uh, uh, the first kind of plugin we're gonna talk about are filters. Um, compressors are a subtype of filter. So a filter is a function that sits between the user's semantic data and the storage layer. So these are like compression. So user wants to write some data to disk. They've got their big array. They feed it through a compressor. They get compressed data. Compressed data makes it to storage. And then on the other side, the user would like to read the data. Data comes into the, the uh, filter compressed, gets decompressed, and then passed back to the user. So filters get attached to data sets. And this means that the user does not actually need to think about compression every time they read or write to a data set. They set it up once when they set up the data set, and then after that, every read and write will go through your code kind of transparently to the user. Another type of filter is checksumming. So if you want to be sure that you've read from disk the data you wrote, you may want to add a little checksum, like an MD5 or, or Fletcher32 type check, so that when you read the data back in memory, you're like, yeah, there's no issues with the disk or whatever, it didn't get messed up. Filters are also composable. So you could run a lossless compression into a checksum and then write that data to disk, make sure you read back the right data, then decompress it. Uh, there's other types of uh, filters that are not necessarily compressors by themselves, but help compressors. So imagine like a delta encoder where instead of storing the values, you store just the diffs between the values. You may want a delta encode and then pass that into a compressor uh, because you think that will get better compression for your data set. Uh, all filters act one chunk at a time. So when you do your IO to the storage, it's always acting in the unit of an entire chunk. So we're gonna read the whole chunk and we're gonna write the whole chunk every time. Uh, kind of visualize this. We've got our user data, they wanna write it, passes through the filter. Let's say it's compression, we're gonna compress it, we're gonna send it to storage. On the other side, the data will move back. When they compose though, uh, the user maybe wants to do a delta encode, compress, checksum, write. And then on the way back, we're gonna first check the checksum, decompress, undo the deltas. So it'll kind of run in reverse order. The default filters that come in HDF5 are LZF, GZIP, SZIP. SZIP is a compression library developed by NASA. I've, the docs say it has some patent issues. I've never needed to use it, it does exist. Uh, scale offset, which is a floating point compression thing that's lossy. 
Shuffle is one of these things that kind of augments another compressor. So it works by shuffling all the bytes within a block to try to get the longest run lengths that it can. And then it stores the kind of transpose. And then uh, Fletcher32 is a checksum. Uh, and with H5Pi, you can compose Shuffle, Fletcher, and one of the compressors. But I'm, I don't actually think you can do a custom pipeline. Um, but that might be coming. Uh, on the other hand, Czar comes with a lot of compressors or filters out of the box. When I say default filters in Czar, uh, what I mean, Czar actually broke out all of its uh, filters into a different library called numcodex. And the idea was that maybe you want to use these filters, but you don't actually want to download Czar or use Czar. You just want to use these algorithms. Um, some important things to note, it has Blosk as a default option. Blosk is a very popular and really efficient uh, library for compression. It's designed to make an optimal trade-off between reading less data into memory and the cost to actually decompress it. So it's optimized for time to getting the decompressed data into memory. Uh, it also has some useful uh, things like categorical encoding. So and it basically implements the same algorithm as pd.categorical, um, where you can store just the unique strings and then indices into that. Um, JSON, message pack, and pickle I've bucketed into one thing because they let you store kind of arbitrary Python objects in your data structure. Might be useful. I, I would recommend not using pickle if you had to do that, though. Um, and then VLAN string would be if you have uh, variably length strings. You can also store VLAN strings in HDF5, but it's with a different type. So you, you don't do it as a filter transformation. Uh, so let's say you actually wanted to write your own filter in HDF5. So like I said, you extend HDF5 by writing C code. It's OK if you don't write C code. I'll try to walk through it, try to stay high level. So the function is going to take as parameters uh, flags, which is going to be a bit mask, um, and else and values, which is going to be an array of integers that are user-defined parameters. So let's say we've got a compressor with a compression level, like uh, you know, Blosk takes compression level from zero to nine, like how much of a trade-off do you want to spend on space versus time? Um, these are kind of like your user-defined options. Notice that the user-defined options all have to be integers and unsigned integers at that. So you don't have a lot of flexibility with the kinds of parameters you can give to a filter. And then the last three arguments are all about the buffer that we're going to be acting on. So remember, the buffer is one chunk of data. Uh, and this is going to be of size n bytes. So we've got n bytes of data. We have a pointer to a buffer, so a pointer to an array of stuff, because it's void. We don't know what's in it. And then this out parameter, which we'll get to in a second. There are really two ways that this works. So this is a single function interface that handles both encoding and decoding, or compression and decompression, um, or, or whatever operation you need to do. So the flags input will have one bit called H5Z. HC does not have namespaces. H5 says this is H5 code. Z says this is an operation or a value that has to do with filters. Don't know why Z is filter, but that's how that namespace works. And then the bit is called flag reverse. So if that bit is true, then we're decoding. So we're saying if that bit is not true, we need to encode the data. The way encoding the data works is that we're going to read the buffer pointed to by buff. Um, and we are going to try to compress the data in place. So we're going to try to shrink the data using that same memory, if possible. Uh, because we're compressing, that should be possible. And if that's the case, then we're just going to return uh, a size, which is uh, the number of bytes in the original buffer. And we're going to write to this output pointer how many bytes of semantic data we have left. So the buffer is 100 bytes. We get a 50% compression ratio, so we now have 50 bytes of data. Buff size will hold a value of 50, and we will return 100. Uh, it's, if that's confusing to you, it's confusing to me. So uh, <laughs> decoding. Uh, on the other hand, we likely cannot reuse that same storage because we're going to make the data bigger. right? So we have 50 bytes now, and we need to fill out 100 bytes. So what we would do instead is allocate a new buffer that's 100 bytes. Then we will free de decompress into that buffer, call free on the thing pointed to by buff, and replace it with our new buffer. We're then going to set the two values to be the same thing. One last thing is that you can return zero, uh, which means that your filter failed. What failure in a filter means is that for some reason, this filter could not be applied to that data. So maybe you've got a compressor that's like, I'm going to assume that most of the blocks are going to look like this. Like they're going to have, 
maybe you have N64 data because you might have some really large ends, but most of your data would fit in, in 32. So you might write a filter that says, just try to put it in N32 and see what happens. If you have a value that's too big for an N32, you could return zero. And then what will happen is HDF5 will just take your filter out of the pipeline. So if your filter is the only thing, it will take the raw input data and write it directly to storage, and it will mark that that happened for this block. And then on read, it will just read the, like the non-compressed data. If you have a big pipeline, it will just kind of skip that one step. Um, another extension point is this function can apply. Uh, the two important arguments are this type ID and this space ID. HID is this HDF5 object pointer because it's object oriented. Type ID is an object that refers to the D type of the data. So is this an integer? If it, given that it's an integer, is it little endian or big endian? How many bytes are, is that are in this integer? Things like that. The space ID is something that refers to the shape of the block. So is this a 64 by 64 block or whatever? So you may write a compressor that requires 2D data or 1D data or blocks that have more than you know, a kilobyte in them or whatever. And you can decide, you know, given this block, I think this filter should just not apply anyway. Uh, and this returns a, a three state variable. So it can fail, return false or true. Next, we're going to define an integer, which is a unique code that refers to our, our filter. So when we create a file that has one of these custom filters in it, and I send this file to someone, we would like to know which filter was applied so we can undo the transformation. To do that, we're just going to store this one unique integer ID. Uh, and the way we actually get this integer is we email the HDF group and we say, hey, I'm writing a new filter. Will you please assign me a number? And they just send you back a number. And they're like, sure, this one's reserved for you. And what this means is that I don't write a filter, like let's say I write my, my delta encoder and someone else writes a you know, gzip thing and we both choose to say, well, my filter ID will just be 3000, no one else will want that. And then I send you the file and you're like, well, 3000 means gzip and then I try to like ungzip decompress the data, but it was actually delta encoded and it's just nonsense. So by having this central authority, you can um, kind of solve that problem. For development purposes though, there is a range of numbers that are reserved for people who are writing plugins before they're done with them. Uh, we're then going to fill out this struct with a bunch of parameters about how this compressor should work. Like, do we have an encoder and a decoder? Where's the filter function? What's the can apply function? A few other things. And then we're going to need to call H5Z. Again, that's like the this is an H5 function about filters register. And we're going to pass this V table. So to actually use this from H5Py, we need to somehow load this native code, so the C code, into our Python process. And here I'm using standard library C types. We need to register our filter. So I'm going to call this register function from C types, assert that it didn't fail, and then I'm going to pull this integer out of the binary. Um, so once we've done all this uh, like dark magic, we can actually just pass this integer as the compression parameter to H5Py, and it will just work. So we'll use our filter now for doing compression for this thing, which is pretty cool. Um, so some difficulties that you'll run into if you're trying to write a custom filter for HDF5. H5Py, by default, distributes binary wheels. Uh, on Linux, binary wheels are only allowed to dynamically link to a small number of libraries. HDF5 is not in that list. That means that they statically link to HDF5. Unfortunately, H5Py, through the way that it gets loaded by Python, does not re-export this H5Z register function. So you can't actually call the register function from your extension by default, which is um, really annoying. So the way you get around this is you don't use the binary wheels and you recompile HDF5 when you install it. You can use this command. I will distribute these slides so people can do this. And what this says is I actually would like to dynamically link my H5Py against HDF5 so that I can then dynamically link my extension against HDF5. And when I call register, HDF5, H5Py and my extension both know about the same H5Z register function and will go in the right place. Um, it's hard to thread parameters to these things. Um, I guess one difficulty I could say is you have to write all this C code and do all this like DLL opening stuff, which I didn't consider when I read this as being a, a thing. But um, it's hard to throw the parameters in, and they have to be integers, so you don't have a lot of configuration. If your function needs some state, I, I don't know why you'd write a stateful encoder, but maybe you, you can get really good compression if you do something like that. Um, you just have a, a C function which can't close over any data, so it's just global state. You have to manage it. Uh, yourself. Uh, maybe more exotic problem, but a very real problem is that when you allocate that buffer, you have to use libc malloc 
because the thing that will free that buffer somewhere deep in HDF5 is free. This seems like it's fine if you write your thing, uh, your filter in C, but we use C++ a lot where I work. I prefer C++ over just writing C. And this means that let's say I want to do like some bit packing thing and I want to use boost dynamic bit set. That's great, but it does not allocate its memory with malloc. So instead of returning a pointer and a custom deallocator, I have to re-implement you know, dynamic bit set myself to make it use malloc, which is just a lot of uh, hassle if you're trying to write your extension in a different language uh, other than C. And as far as I can tell, uh, you can't use your filter in a custom pipeline. So you can feed your filter into, you can have shuffle happen before your filter and then Fletcher happen after that, but you can't compose it with an existing compressor. Uh, and then this isn't really a problem, but just a thing to consider is that they don't trigger until flush. So you don't know if the code is gonna succeed or not uh, until you actually flush it. So the write may appear to succeed before it gets flushed. Uh, some benefits though is that because the filter ID, the filter IDs use a central authority, so you're not gonna run into any problems where you don't understand how to open a file. You can pretty much tell for certain, like, I don't know what this filter is and I'm gonna crash, or I know this is filter whatever and I need to go load that. Um, and actually, skipping over, there's a directory, a plugin directory where you can dump these shared objects and, and HDF5 will like know to go load them and try to find which thing provides your plugin. Uh, because the filters are all written in C and HDF and C has a lot of bindings, you can kind of use your filters in any language that you would want to open your file in. Um, yeah. So alternatively, if you wanted to write a filter in Zar, we would uh, install num codex and import it. Uh, and we're going to grab this codec class. And then we need to implement three functions uh, or two functions, encode and decode. So encode is going to take a Python buffer like object and it's going to return the encoded buffer and decode is gonna take the buffer to decode and we'll return that. And it can also optionally take an output buffer. So this is gonna be pre-allocated memory that you should write into. Uh, you also need to set this codec ID, which is a string, unlike an integer, and that's gonna be kind of the unique thing that gets written into the file. So when we open the czar file, we know what filter was used. And then we need to call register codec. So this code all fits on a slide. Uh, the other one, like the H5 one didn't. And then to use it in Zar, you just import it like a Python object, and you can pass either compressor equals an instance of your filter, or you can pass filters in then a list, and it's gonna, they're all gonna happen in the order defined in that list. And then for decompression, they're gonna run back through the other way. Uh, so some problems with these are that because there's no central authority, I can write a thing that doesn't necessarily work um, with your filter, and then we both choose the same name, and now you get like corruption on reads. Uh, they require Python code. So like I said before, while Czar has a spec that could and has been implemented in other languages, not really a good way to make your plugins work with that language. So yes, I have my C++ implementation, but I can't open your filter because I don't want to embed the Python interpreter in my C++ application or whatever. Uh, and this one maybe is controversial, but I think most compressors or filters are gonna wanna be written in native code anyway. Like, you're probably not writing your new compression li like library in Python. So, you know, you probably wanted native code if you're doing anything custom. Though, I will say, as a good point, it is written in Python. So if someone has already provided bindings for an existing thing that you would just like to make czar aware, then you can, you know, kind of easily drop that in. Um, because it's written in Python, you can distribute your filters as a Python package. So that kind of solves that problem, as long as everything in your ecosystem is using Python. Uh, it's really easy to pass parameters. You can pass constructor arguments to your class, and that's, um, those will be the parameters to your filter. It, managing state is very easy because it's an instance of a class. You can store state right on itself. One thing to note is that the codex must be JSON uh, serializable and there's a hook that you can implement as part of the, uh, so the base class uh, here, codec, provides some help to make things JSON to serializable by default, but you can override it if you need to store things like a NumPy D type or, um, or some other more complicated object. Um, in my opinion, having the API split between encode and decode is far more clear than just having a single function interface, uh, and then you can actually use filter pipelines in a very clean way. So I don't have time to go through this whole example, but to make sure I understood all this correctly while writing this talk, I wrote a delta of delta filter, uh, which instead of storing the deltas, it stores the delta of deltas, which is actually very good for things where you have a regularly spaced 
uh, sample and the, the variation between the spacing is uh, small. So this, this will show how to do it in both HDF5 and ZAR so you can compare them yourself. Um, so the next type of plugin that you might wanna write is storage. So the idea of the storage protocol is that uh, storing the actual data is not a concrete thing in either the ZAR or the HDF5 spec. Um, so there's really no single file type. You can't point and say like this representation of bytes on disk is HDF5 and this is R. There's like different ways you can choose to store these things. Uh, they're user configurable um, and really there's two kinds of data that you may need to store. The first is of course the user data. So you... They're, they're self-describing. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the question was, or comment was they're self-describing in either case, um, where I believe you mean like... Sorry. By self-describing, do you mean like the tree... It's like Little Indian or whatever, there's some... Yeah, so like how the data is actually encoded, you should be able to recover. As long as you use the same driver or storage protocol to read the thing that you wrote, uh, that's kind of the only thing that you need to know. But you can't just try to... Let, so maybe to answer your question, no, you actually need to know how to open the same file. Um, there's nothing in the file that tells you how to open it because it's so abstract that I could write something that just uses a totally different protocol than another driver, but they're both HDF5 or they're both ZAR. Um, so in the file, we store two kinds of data, the user data. This is all of the things that make up the multidimensional arrays and the attributes that get stored in the tree. And then there's the metadata, which is the kind of the tree structure. So all the things that meet, are needed to be stored so that we know what are the groups and what are the children of the group and, and all of that stuff. And then maybe any extra information that we need to know about that's specific to this storage protocol would get stored somewhere. Uh, the HDF5 storage model is built on what's called a virtual file driver. And the way this works conceptually is that you've got one big contiguous memory space. So this is kind of like an allocator. So the types of things that you would need to implement are like grow the memory space. Uh, importantly, there's no shrink the memory space. If you delete data from HDF5, the file does not get smaller. It will never get smaller. You just have to copy it into, like semantically copy it into a new file. Um, when you are writing, the, the layer that actually handles all of the IO does not know anything about the semantic data. So it, you've got one big memory space and you implement things like write these bytes at this address um, or read, read 15 bytes at this address or so on. You don't actually know, like, is this a chunk? Is this half of a chunk? Is this metadata? Is this the tree? I don't really know. Uh, HDF5 is responsible for all kinds of caching and locking. So, um, and it's single threaded. So you know that your driver is always called in the single threaded context, which is um, kind of a problem in my opinion. The ZAR storage model, on the other hand, is based, because it's Python oriented, it's based on a, basically a dictionary from string to bytes. Uh, any object that fulfills the Python uh, mapping, or really the mutable mapping protocol, is a storage driver for ZAR. The key that gets passed contains semantic information, so you can do uh, transformations uh, if you need to. So for example, this key, group slash dset slash 0.3, this is telling us that we are storing data uh, for a data set called dset inside a group called group that's at the root. And we have two dimensional chunks, and this is the chunk, chunk zero along axis zero and chunk three along axis one. So this key alone tells us a lot of information about what data is being stored. The storage model, or the, the mapping object is responsible for its own caching, or sorry, locking. You can have ask ZAR to like provide locking for you, but you can also handle your own locking. And uh, importantly, that means that you can do multi-threaded access to the same data. Uh, because they're all built on mutable mappings, all of these objects are composable. So you could write, for example, a storage mutable mapping that says, I'd like to store data set one on disk, and I'd like to store data set two like in memory, because I don't actually care about it. It's just a temporary or whatever. And you could build all of that by composing an in-memory store and an on-disk store, or doing more exotic things if you need to. Uh, the default storage backends that come in HDF5, the first one is called sec2. Don't know why it's called that, but it uses the POSIX file API uh, to do unbuffered access. There's a Windows driver for using the Windows file API, stood.io for doing uh, buffered C standard IO stuff, Core, which is in memory, so the file will just be used 
uh, purely in memory stuff, and then family, where it stores a directory of blocks. The family driver is strange because it works by breaking up the virtual contiguous memory space into four gigabyte blocks. And this is because HD5 first came out in 1998, where 64-bit file systems are not common. And you wanted to be able to use a 64-bit virtual memory space on a file system that could not support a single file larger than four gigabytes. So it, it actually just lays out like, here's the first four gigs, then the next four gigs, and you would just kind of cap them together uh, through this driver. And then H5Py supports this driver called FileObj, which allows you to pass an arbitrary Python file-like object to H5Py. So you could hook, write, and read using the Python protocol, which is pretty cool. Czar has, again, like far more options. Uh, some interesting ones are that you've got your memory store, uh, like I said before, uh, but some cool ones are the S3 map and the ABS store. So these are dictionaries that map blocks to S3, like Amazon S3 object storage or Azure Blob storage. So instead of having a file located on disk, you could pass someone an S3 URI and they would be downloading the chunks on demand. Uh, and then two that are uh, really cool, like I mentioned, because it's composable, instead of having czar manage block caching for you, you would instead construct an LRU store cache around whatever actual I.O. thing you wanted. So let's say you're reading data out of S3. It's very expensive to pull a block. You'd like to cache it. You could create an LRU store cache over an S3 map. And then the S3 map will pull the data and then feed it to this LRU cache and handle that for you. And then consolidated metadata store is a feature that HDF5 supports, but not in a user configurable way. Uh, when you write a driver, you say, do you want uh, consolidated or not? And what this is, is that all of the tree structure can be stored in one big allocation, uh, which will be read and written in one big block. So imagine, again, you've got your like S3 storage. It's really expensive to pull any data, high latency. You don't want to have to make a lot of little reads just to discover, like, what are the children of this data set I'd like to iterate? So you can say, say try to store it all in one big block, and, and I will pull it all together. Um, you don't need to make your custom store know about that. The consolidated metadata store can look at the keys, parse out the semantic information, and, and then send new keys into your uh, map, which is really cool. Uh, as a default, if you're going to use R, I recommend looking at the LMDB store. It is uh, LMDB is a key value store. Uh, it's really efficient, but I think there's some licensing concerns to maybe look at. And then otherwise, the zip store is a really good way to store a single file on disk. It stores it in a zip file where each file is the block. Uh, so if you want to write a custom file driver in HDF5, you need to fill out this struct called an H5FD, so HDF5 FD for file driver uh, class. This is basically a big virtual function table that tells us like, how to open and close a file and such. Uh, so like I said before, write is going to take a bunch of arguments and then this H adder T. This is the address we want to write to, a buffer, this is the data we want to write, and the size of that buffer. So it says, hey, put these bytes at this address. And importantly, we don't know like, what these represent. Um, all of this data is coming in after it's been compressed, or it's metadata, so it's not compressed. We don't really know. Read has the same API, except the buffer is not const, so we're going to write into it. And then we need to fill out uh, 28 more functions. So the functions are things like flush, set EOA, set EOF, uh, truncate, like all kinds of basically like memory allocator slash file IO type operations. Um, However, H5Py does actually support a nice Python interface for registering new drivers, so we don't have to run into that issue like we had before. So assuming you've packaged your driver as a Python extension module, which is a whole other topic we'll talk about later. Um, we will not talk about it in this talk, though. Uh, you need to implement this function called set FAPL, which is the file access property list. Um, once you've implemented that, you can pass h5py.register driver. You give it a name for use in memory, and then the function. And then when you construct a file, you can pass driver equals and then that string key. The path that's going to get passed is going to be just a string that gets fed to your driver's open function. So in the S3 case, or like let's say you wrote a driver that did the same thing where it stored data in S3, uh, maybe by blocking it up in like two megabyte blocks or something. Uh, instead of maybe passing a path to memory on a uh, file on disk, you would pass an S3 URI. So this doesn't actually have to be a file path as the first argument. It's just a string that would be passed to your drivers open. And then any extra keyword arguments that you pass to file will be forwarded to the set file access property list. So um, 
yeah, so pretty reasonable support. Some problems with this, it's a huge API. Like I said, you have to implement all these functions. There's no semantic information about what's being stored. It's really hard to optimize because of that. So let's say you wanted to like break up data on disk based on which data set it was in and like maybe cache based on like the chunks. You don't know what you're reading or writing, so you can't make any optimizations around the, the data. They're not easily composable because like HDF5 doesn't export these V tables easily to you, so you can't get you know, one driver's read or write function. Uh, and you have to like have the library implement things like consolid metadata or caching for you. You can't write that as an API thing. Uh, another thing is that there's an ABI incompatibility between versions 1.8 and 1.10. So HDF5 has two versions that are being used in like commonly. And while those look like minor versions, those are actually major versions and they have API incompatibilities. So you'd have to recompile your extensions for both 1.8 and 1.10. Uh, and it's single threaded. So imagine I talked, you were doing that S3 case, like I mentioned before, reading data is expensive. You may want to do that asynchronously. You cannot issue multiple asynchronous reads from HDF5. Um, so that's kind of like a non-starter for anything where IO is going to be really expensive. Uh, we can save a question for the end. I'm like about to run out of time. So uh, then one last thing. Not many people have published file drivers that I can see, so there's not a lot of like examples for like how do I distribute these, how do I write them. Uh, some good points: the set FAPL interface makes it easy to thread arguments that are not just integers; they can be arbitrary data types with custom allocators and destructors. Um, really easy state management. The source. So while not a lot of people have written third-party drivers, the source code of the built-in ones are really really nice. Like the sec2 driver is extremely easy to read. The family driver also fairly easy to read. Um, these can be built to minimize copies. So because the read interface gets past the pre-allocated buffer to fill, you don't necessarily need to do a copy every time you read. You can read the data right off disk into that buffer um, if you are using uh, stores that support that type of operation. Uh, because everything has the same virtual contiguous memory space, you can potentially align all your blocks together and then test a driver by feeding it into another opening it with another driver. Um, don't, I'm just going to skip that. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, and then it's also always a 64-bit memory space. Not necessarily an interesting point today, but definitely amazing that they decided to do that in 1998. Like, really um, good stuff. Uh, so to write a custom storage backend in ZAR, on the other hand, we don't need to import anything from ZAR. We import mutable mapping from collections.abc in the standard library. We need to implement uh, five functions, get item, set item, and delete item, and then iter and len. So all very basic Python stuff, nothing ZAR specific. Um, one big problem with this API is you'll notice that get item just takes the key. And the storage acts one chunk at a time. So imagine I've got a 1D data set, chunks are length 10, and I would like to read 100 elements from this data set. And my data, maybe my read is perfectly aligned on the first chunk. So with HDF5, I would pass my, my buffer of size 100 into the read call, and it would each piece would fill in the output uh, over that different disjoint slice. With ZAR, on the other hand, I will have my big buffer of output allocated, and then every time I call get, I'm going to get a newly allocated buffer of length 10, and then I have to copy it 10 bytes at a time into this buffer. Um, so you actually have to do a copy on every single chunk for a read. Is this a big deal? Probably not. I would say most drivers are going to be dominated by just fetching the data into memory and doing a copy, like a memcp of one block at a time. Not really a big deal, but um, this is a thing you might need to profile. Uh, probably reasonable to ask them to make a change to like add an extension API. Um, we can talk to people about that. Uh, it's really the only problem I have with it. The beauty of these are that they're composable. Um, you can do user-defined caching, so the, you, like, you as a library extender can do a lot more stuff. You have semantic information to make more powerful optimizations and transformations. Uh, and they're written in Python, where I thought filters will most likely want to be written in native code or use native code somewhere. Because storage backends are super I.O. bound, like, the overhead of the Python code is really not significant. And then one last thing, which I, I don't think I, I mentioned, is because it uses the mapping protocol, Things can be used as ZAR storage backends that were not written for ZAR. Like S3 map that I mentioned uh, earlier is not like written to be used as a ZAR backend, but it can become a ZAR backend. So while you have to settle with this copying issue, which is maybe not a big deal, you actually unlock all these great storage backends that were not specifically designed for ZAR. 
Um, so some takeaways, Zara's got a lot of modern features. It's actively developed. The devs are really responsive and helpful. Every issue I've opened has been like addressed quickly. People have talked to me about how I was using Zara and like want to make sure they understood my use cases. Um, it's Python focused or really like Python specific. Star because actively working on changing that or making it more language agnostic. Uh, and I'd say it's much easier to prototype extensions. So even with filters, writing them as a prototype in Python is pretty nice. HD5, on the other hand, has really stable code and it's mature. A lot of people use it. Great cross-language support, very single-threaded. Uh, if you want to write a custom driver that would like asynchronous stuff, you're out of luck. Uh, and it's harder to write extensions, at least uh, for most people who go to PyData. Um, so these are some links uh, to my GitHub, the example uh, from before, a implementation of a file driver for HDF5 that uses S3 and does break up the memory space. I will say I would not recommend using it in the process of writing this. I found the dangerously single-threaded problem to make this really not suitable for production. So it's it, interesting as a learning exercise, not really for production. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is, is there an HDFS storage backend for ZAR, and if not, could it be done? Uh, if there is a mapping protocol interface to HDFS, then yes. I do not know the answer to that. Could it be done? Probably. There's a library that S3 map is built on, which is basically this like generic file system-like library. It's not fused, but it's basically like abstractions over file systems. Um, and so they have a map adapter for a file, arbitrary file system, so probably. Can Zara files be easily chunked in an appropriate way? Um, so, the, so you store one key at a time. So however you want to choose to do that. So yes. Oh, but not, not anything lower than a single data. You can't like, there's no natural way to chunk the data, so individual data set. No, yeah, so yeah, you can chunk, each data set can be chunked. Each chunk is stored as an as a uh, like an atomic piece. So how you choose to put those chunks together for one data set or for one group or whatever is up to the storage backend. But each chunk of a data set is the atomic piece that gets stored. So one of the shortcomings in running into with HDFS is. Uh, that it has a hard time appending data. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that same thing is true for ZAR. Is that, is that a property of chunking when you store on disk? Uh, so the, the question is that uh, HDF5 has a problem with appending data. Does ZAR have a similar problem, or is this intrinsic to chunking, right? Yeah. Uh, so chunking, I would say, actually makes it easier to append data. Importantly, you can have data sets that can be extended along different dimensions. So if you stored like row major data, you might only be able to add a new row, but you couldn't add a new column without copying everything. If you stored like 2D chunks, you can add rows and columns. HDF5 has, I would actually say, does not actually have a big problem with writes. Many people don't write efficiently into HDF5. So HDF5, while the data sets are array-like, they have one extension, which is resize, where you can grow a data set. So really what you're supposed to do is like, re you should like resize very aggressively, like vector style, like double, 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 and then write slices into it. Um, we have a very append heavy workload with HDF5 and have found it to, so at different times I found problems. One issue is that writes all happen at the chunk level. So if you have a lot of compression being applied, it's gonna be applied on every write. Another reason you wanna like batch up a big write um, one thing we've done around that is like batching, like storing data in memory and then trying to do like a batch thing. If you're using ZAR, then the, the chunking or how the append behavior works really depends on the driver. So in the zip file case, every time I add a new chunk, we grow the zip file by the size of that chunk. Uh, but if you were doing like an S3 store, for example, every chunk is just gonna be a unique object in S3. You can write like as many of those in parallel as you want. There's really not gonna be any overhead. Uh, yeah, so uh, comment is comments on cloud object storage for ZAR, but not for HDF5. 
Uh, the reason I don't comment on that is, be, or didn't talk about it a lot, is that there's no default solution for that that comes in the library. Uh, this link, the S3 file driver for HDF5 is, is that thing, but because of the single threaded limitations, um, it's probably fine if you have a very large multi-dimensional data set and you can have one big read going into it. A use case that we've had is like, I would like to do the same read out of multiple data sets and every read from HDF5 is serialized behind the other one because of the locking. So it makes it hard when every single read is really slow. So imagine it takes me like two milliseconds to read or like 200 milliseconds to read or whatever because it's like a lot of data, I gotta decompress it. If I could do 200 millisecond reads like five times in parallel, that's great. If I have to serialize all of them behind each other, it starts to look really, really bad. Well, based on your experience, is it an exaggeration to say if you need to store your data on the files? Yeah. Are at the moment? It, it just changed, like what, two weeks ago, I think. Yeah, so um, in HDF5 112, which is a new version, they actually have a new type of file system hook that's going to be called the virtual object store instead of the virtual file system or file driver. And the idea is to store with basically closer to the uh, czar model where you store key value pairs and which represent the chunks. But I don't know when that comes out or if that is out. Um, I just learned about this today. So even if, even if that was out, that's all the concurrency issue? I don't know. Well, probably not. So yeah, it depends. So things that need to get the lock held is that there's a chunk cache in HDF5. So every time I read a chunk and decompress it, I hold the decompressed version in a cache mm -hmm. and it's an LRU cache, uh, which is configurable. Um, HDF5 used to not be able, or H5Pi used to not have options to configure that cache. There was a third party library that exposed those functions that probably changed. I don't know if you, so it can be configured. Updating that cache requires holding a lock. So that might be one reason where you can't do that. However, I imagine they didn't write the virtual object system without considering this type of like new cloud storage model. So they may have relaxed that requirement. I, I'm not sure though. I haven't looked into it. Okay, well, thank you very much.